Hi, Andrea. Hi, everybody. So we're going to go over unit two today, which is the next two chapter short. If you can please log in Canvas and download um, your assignments and notes. Let me get to We'll start in a couple minutes, so just hang tight. So we'll write a little bit more program today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about variables, data types. I will try to update your grades, maybe by tomorrow. Sorry, I had a um, some a class on Saturday and then I got tied up yesterday just trying to get some work done. Fairly simple today. So we are going over unit two. Um, if you can access Canvas, please look in Canvas for Unit 2 notes and assignments. I think most of you will are on Canvas now. Um, if you need the files, we can drop in the files for you. So I'm going to go into screen share. If you have any questions, please unmute and ask. Um, there will be time that we will use Python Idle or if you're using an IDE, so you can open those, uh, you know, those application as well. Okay, so I will demo some of the very short little program on idle. Okay, so um, when we look at the module, I posted the assignments and, and notes, and then I will activate the lab. I just got to finalize some of the things, and then I'll add those tasks. Okay, so you can find your notes and your assignment in Canvas in module two. Um, so to start, let me close this. I will zoom in a little bit so you can see better. So just to review, um, last week we touched on how to install Python. We want to use version 3.x. So I think the current is 3.8.x. Um, it changes frequently. So if you download the 3.8.2 or later, or 3.8.0, which I downloaded, um, that will be okay. And once you install Python, 
uh, you will find idle, which is equipped with Python. Um, I included in last week IDE for you to use. So if you wish, you can use other IDE like Eclipse, Visual Studio Code, Atom, um, Tony, you know. So, but I'm mainly gonna use idle because that comes with the package. Um, in idle, you will find two modes. There is the interactive shell mode, which is only used line by line and it mainly for command base and then the other mode is to be able to use the text editor to write the complete script so in idle it also highlights some of the syntax and keywords so all ide should have this feature some ide have better debugging tools um, i put down that there's some lack in code completion in the case where you're doing unit testing this entire application, there might be lacking in that area. So you, if you're looking to build software, um, you might wanna consider using better IDE. So um, what we see is that in shell, we can generally type in numbers and we can perform basic calculation using those number for example two plus three is going to give you five and then if you input this into the shell and press enter so i'll open idle so i can show you and i'm running windows 10 application so here is the shell so if we simply perform two plus three like this just like any console we we would get an output five and if we do two is less than three, we would get a true statement. Now let's say we're trying to do two is greater than three, it's gonna tell us false. So we can see that it can perform command base and also calculation processing and at the shell level. And it uses the interpreter as we last touched on what Python consists of. And a lot of the time you would see programmer refer to Python as a scripting language because we mainly write script. And in cybersecurity, as some of you are in cybersecurity, scripting is essential. So what we have is we would have the shell mode and then to get into the writing of the entire script, you would go file, new file. And this opens up the text editor in our idle. And last week we did some print, right? A hello world. So we can do a program that display, right? Your string and inside the parentheses, we can put in the string parameter. We can say hello CIS 30A. And we done this last week. So as you write your script, when you complete your script, you would go file, save as, and you need to save it into a location. So let's say I wanted to put it on my desktop. I can say hello, CIS, right, dot PY. And PY is a file extension for Python. So we always want to use the file extension there, right? Ultimately, it's a text editor in the back here. That's what we use. So all programming languages use some form of text editor. It depends on the IDE that you use. Um, I previously used Notepad for Java, or you can use Notepad++, you can use Sublime. So we can use any text editor to really write our program. Ultimately, the consistency is that we want to write a program for a specific language. So for Python, we would use .py, and then you know for Java, we would use .java, and C is C++ is CVP. So here we can click save, and when you run the program, you would see the output on shell if you're using idle. So we can click run, right, just to review, and we would see that it's outputting text right there. Okay. Um, that is just to capture some of the things that we've done in week one. And 
So here it talks about how you can create a new file in your text editor and you would save it as a py file, then you would run it by clicking run or you can press F5 on your keyboard. And the print function is a built-in function in the Python library that allows you to display string um, or to display a number. So we can display an integer, we can display string if we put it in quotation mark. And for Python, you would use single or double quotation mark. It's a little bit more forgiving than other languages. Um, I think last week either Andrea or someone asked me a question and I was wrong that I told you that you only use hashtag for every line, but when you do multi-line comment, you can use three double quotation mark or three single quotation mark. And this allows us to comment, right, like about the program or include some kind of instructions for other programmers. So let's say that I want to comment about this program. I can simply put the quotation marks in like this, right? And I can say this program is about displaying text in console, right? And using print function. So when we finish the multi-line comment, we would close it out with, again, the three quotation marks. So that simply allows the interpreter to ignore those lines that considering not processing it as part of the, your script. So and in some cases, we would be required to do multi-line comment. Now, if you want to do a single line comment, you would use simply the hashtag and you can say this program is in Python like this. Okay. And um, we don't want to comment every line because that can get very tedious and it can be cluttered. So what we can do is we can comment different section of our script to really denote what that, that the functionality of, of that section or you know, some kind of information about that section. So this is mainly for the programmer, the person that writes the program um, or other programmers that's gonna be reviewing the program. Um, but, you know, and sometimes you can make a little comment to really go back and review and fix some of the areas or add some of the components to that area. So we would use comment for that purpose. Now, um, the textbook, it touches a little bit on Eclipse and how to use packages with Eclipse. I don't specifically want to instruct for a certain IDE unless it's equipped with the actual package because when you go into organizations to work either as programmer, as security professional, you will find that companies will not, you know, they would use specific tool or sometimes that they don't use specific IDE and they will leave it up to you. So teaching it to a specific IDE would create restriction for the student, then that student would only know that interface for the IDE. So um, I want you to be more flexible with what you use. So in the case where, you know, most IDE is gonna have very similar UI user interface. So what you should think about is choosing the IDE that's gonna be adequate for the job meaning that it's gonna be efficient for the purpose of, of your task and also has a good debugging library and somewhat easy to navigate user interface. So um, I will leave that up to you to choose, okay? Now, um, in the first, uh, the first question of our assignment, we want to address the question as it's asked, okay? So it tells you to open up idle shell and I want you to input 100 plus 200 
so that way you can get a result. You should get 300, but we just want to make sure. So here we use the plus sign as the operator to operate the calculation of those integers in shell. So what we have is, here's my shell, right? And I can say 100 plus 200, which gives me 300. And you simply do that and take the screen capture for me. Okay. So obviously we saw that it outputs, unless you have syntax error, you have typo. Right, you, in, you intend to put a plus sign and you type something else or you intend to put numbers and you type text, that might create issue. So make sure that we have the proper typing, right? And syntax simply is the rule on how we would write, write out our script. And the book says guidelines, but really it's, you know, the way that the, the application is designed is, is understanding specific things that would be inputted, right? Like how we would say, this is how we would write a sentence in English, or this is how we would speak in English or another language like Spanish or Chinese or, you know, so what we have is we have specific rules on how we would write certain things in every language, in every programming language. So after you complete the first task is to input 100 plus 200 in shell and press enter, you would see the result. It should give you 300, right? So just answer the question. It says, what, can, what do you see as a result? Can we use integers and numbers in shell? Sure, definitely, because ultimately the computer, as I mentioned last week, is a calculator, right? And when we use it, we can use it to process complex things, or we can use it to process very simple tasks like addition like this. Then next, we are going to put in shell 50 is greater than 40 and we are using a greater than operator and in chapter 5 we'll do more of the you know different types of operator we'll go over those concepts and how to use compound assignment operator um, and then after that we'll get into loops but so in shell what we can simply do is we would do 50 is greater than 40 and we simply want to check right, to see if that's true. So if it's true that 50 as an integer is larger than 40, it will tell you that it's true. Now, if I put in 50 is greater than 100, it's gonna tell me that it's false. So in this case, it's actually using bool or Boolean to validate to the user, right, in console or in shell that it is true what you type is correct, okay? So after we input that into shell, we would state our result. What did you see, right? If you wanna screen capture it real quick, that's fine. You can type out the answer. If you don't wanna do screen capture, I'm okay with that. And to do screen capture on your computer, you can use the print screen button right, like R and Windows, you would use Alt Print Screen to take active window, meaning that the window that you're using. So make sure that you open up shell and see the result and you can do that. Okay. As we previously talked about comments, we can answer this question. So simply we can say that for our comment, we can use hashtag to do a single line comment. I'm gonna use a different color here for a single line comment. And we would use triple quotation marks, either double or single is fine for multi-line. 
comment. Now, we mentioned that comment is used to add details and notes for the, the script. Okay, any questions so far as we discuss shell, how to use numbers with shell and operators with shell, and then also comments in our program? Okay, no question. And, you know, as preference, I generally love Python a little more than C++ or other language only because it's very simple. Once you understand the syntax and you understand how to use write Python or write Python, it's really simple to create program. Most languages, once you understand the basics, it's, it's easy to really write. But some programming language would require a little bit more you know, just to output text or to input text or input, con you know, content um, and so forth. So just going through the basics here, okay? Now in the next part of chapter three, it goes over errors. And for beginners, a lot of the times you would see that a a person would have syntax error, meaning that just typo in the program or in the script. So syntax, as we mentioned, and this is textbook definition, it's guidelines on what's needed to write correctly in a certain language. And so often that you would find syntax error is you know, missing certain symbol or you know, certain character like quotation marks or in some cases in other languages like semicolon. But the often the mistakes is really typo missing a bracket like the parentheses or curly braces. So often that you, when you have this mistype or typo, you would find the interpreter telling you that this is wrong. And some IDEs are better at this in telling you which line, right? Or other debugging library will tell you how to fix it. So, this is where you would see the features coming through as detecting error, right, in the ID. So let's say that I write, you know, 20 line program and on the 10th line, I made an error, right? I had a miss, a typo, a syntax error. And the ID that I use, it would, when I click run, after I click run, it's going to tell me, oh, it cannot process this because it would come across this error and it's on this line. So you simply go back to your program, right, your script and look at specific area. Now, if the ID doesn't tell you which line it is, I would recommend going through line by line to see what is missing. And sometimes it takes a few tries. Right. If we, you're not familiar with it, then you, you have to look at it again. So you must correct the errors. And then after you correct it, you would save and execute it again. So anytime that you modify the program, you have to make sure that you save and rerun the program. OK, so some of the common causes for syntax error is wrongly written keywords. And we'll touch on some of the keywords, right? Uh, wrongly, uh, you use the wrong operator. And, you know, for getting parentheses for function call, or, you know, if you forget to use a certain character. 
and not putting strings in single or double quotes. So make sure the quotation marks is there. So those are some of the things that the textbook highlight as common issues, especially syntax error. So let's go to our assignment now. So for four, it asks you what type of error in the, is in the following statement. Sorry, I'm missing the is there. And that would be print hello world. And we know that this intended to be a string, right? And string, we need to make sure that we put it in a single or double quotation mark. So we want to correct that. So I simply put that this is a syntax error. It's missing quotation marks. And we can simply correct it by retyping it as print and then add the quotation marks. So in your script, you can simply go in and add the quotation marks for hello world and then save and rerun. Any question? Now, that could be your job, right? Like for someone to go through and fix a program for someone else. Okay, debug the program. And it could be more than just syntax, right? It could be going in and, and you know, troubleshoot why this program is not functioning as it should, or, you know, at, look at the, the lack of security in the program and fix the security for that program. So at very simple level, we can troubleshoot our own program by first looking at the syntax error, what area that's occurring. Now let's switch back to the notes. The next type of error is the runtime error. So make sure we know the difference. So for your quiz and your test, <coughs> you will be given a similar question to four. I will give you, you know, a snippet of your of a script and then I will ask what type of error that you see there and and choose the option for to fix that error right so for the runtime error this occurs during execution and sometimes the program just halt right it just stop and I see this a lot when I teach programming classes, students will ask me, I don't know why my program stopped working, right? Simply that you have runtime error, okay? So that means that it cannot operate something, something is wrong, it cannot carry out certain tasks. So what we need to do is we need to go and look at what could possibly be wrong and to start, right? Like I know that it might be tedious to look at a hundred lines of, 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 of code, but you might have to go line by line and see why that is, right? Um, Sometimes go to the section that, where it is the main function, the functionality of the program is in a certain section. So look at that section and maybe see why. Sometimes it would run partially and then it would stop. So that would give you a hint on where it actually occurs. So see where it last ran, which line of code where it last ran, it last interpreted, and then following that up with what's, what's stopping it, okay? So we, you have to really search for that section and it tends to be the most difficult out of the three. Or in some cases, you might be running low on memory or RAM, where it's not able to allocate memory, con container in memory to be able to fit complete that program. Or when you do mathematically, we know that when we divide by zero, that's not possible. Right. So when you try to operate division of zero, that could that violates the mathematical rule. So that will create runtime error as well. So those are some of the 
common things that you would see, right? Buffer is full and you try to divide by zero. So in the next question, it asks you, what happens when a runtime error occurs? That means that it's going to end the program. And in general, right, you would get an error message. And, but the big hint is that the program halt or it stops. The book also mentioned that in some cases, the system would shut down, right? Now, when you're running your OS, some of you are familiar with this. Sometimes you come across where you have like, you know, memory issues. Okay, you like especially Windows. So you do see some of the air coming through because ultimately operating system is a software, right? So program would end abruptly or system would shut down. So simply your program stops or your system stops. Any question regarding runtime error? So we see this across all languages. Okay. Now with the logical error. Oh, question. Yes. With a runtime error, is that when you run out of RAM, are you talking about a very large Python program? Yes. Okay. So let's say that you build a game and you would have different containers incorporated in that program, right? And you see this with a lot of like high graphic base or game base too. So if the user system doesn't have specific or enough memory to be able to, to run that program, yeah, it's gonna halt. So now, Python and Java and other languages are good at garbage collection. So as a programmer, we really have to think about how we allocate space, right? That space is used, make sure that it's efficient. Even though in a lot of the software, it will say this is the minimal number amount of RAM that's needed. But sometimes the user, they're not aware of the technical aspect of it and they would install it and they would run it and then it would stop, right? So in general, it would generate error. But when you plan out and design your program, you should consider how many containers you're using. So when you're doing flow, flow chart and you know the diagram, diagram out your program, you really have to take a look at that, right? what should we allocate to write this program efficiently? Thank you. Any, you're welcome. Any other question? Okay. Next is your logical error. And the book example is they use the um, formula to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. And simply that it's missing the the, the bracket or the parentheses around certain arithmetic um, operation. So we intend for 20 to subtract 32 and then do the multiplication division after. So in the explanation, it says that you would get two separate results because in Python, and many other languages, it's going to try to operate the multiplication and the division first. So next week, we'll touch a little bit more on operators and priority of operators or operator uh, precedence. So in this case, it's going to try to operate the multiplication and the division first, and then it's going to do the subtraction and the addition after. So you would get wrong result. So logical error really intends to say that this occur because possibly that you have something missing, like here we would add in the bracket, and it's going to produce the wrong result. And we don't want wrong result in application. Imagine, let's say that you download an app 
right, to calculate your finances. And that app has, it's wrong, right? It produces wrong result. It gives you wrong numbers. That's not a good thing, right? Uh, it's not good for the company that you're working for. It's, if it's your app that you release and you own that app, that can create problems. So we wanna make sure that we check for a logical error to make sure that we produce accurate results, okay? And so we would have a certain expectation of accuracy for our program. Now, mind you that they say there's no perfect 100% system, but we want to get to a very small margin of error. And especially when you're looking at like scientific calculation type of applications or in like security analysis, we wanted to get as close as to our objective as possible, right? Like if we want, if our objective is as close as to 100% accuracy, then that's great. So in my experience, scientifically, you know, I was trained when I was going through graduate school that the margin should be less than, you know, point, less than 3%. So if you fall anything outside of that, you're way off. So it's a very small margin that we have to work with, right? And when it's reaching 3%, that's pretty large. So when we're looking at analysis for things that should be accurate, and when you're dealing with assets for company, like security systems and, and people and money, right? That 3% can be a very high margin. So you want to, you know, when we deal with millions or billions of dollars, we want to make sure that it has minimal error, okay? Whether you're in computer science or security, we have to look at, you know, how we construct this program to, or script to make sure that it produces accuracy, okay? So here it tells you that you need to go through it with, you know, find, you know, thoroughly to find out the error even though it executes normally, right? It's not gonna throw any error message or anything. It will execute, but the output is wrong, okay? So now, in the next question, is this Maggie created a Python program that produces wrong result? What type of error is Maggie facing? What should Maggie do, right? So she's facing a logical error. And suggestion would be Maggie should review the program line by line to identify the error and correct the error. So when I teach discrete structure or, you know, even assembly classes, other programming classes, I have students that turn in program, functioning program, and then when I run the program, like after a few tries, I come across error, right, logical errors, and then I would give them feedback, like this is, you know, it's, it's working, but it's not appropriately working, so this is some of the error you need to look at. Now, realistically, real world, if you turn that in, right, as your working project for your company, that will not be good because now, you know, when they start going through testing, they're gonna say, well, you know, you didn't check closely enough. Okay, so before we get into this part, when we look at the string and last week we, in our lab one, we talked a little bit about escape character. So we're gonna revisit that in this. Okay, so just make sure that you understand. Okay, so that kind of wrap up chapter three. It's pretty straightforward. It, it's mainly review of the, the last two, and it touches on how to troubleshoot some of the areas in, in your script. Any question in chapter three? Um, uh, Dr. Nguyen? Or yes. I just have one question. Um, I just want to make sure I'm on the right page. Um, 
So uh, logical errors are usually um, the program will run, but it doesn't mean that the program's correct, right? Yes. Okay. The result is not correct. So let's say that I do a program that calculate tax for my client, right? Like TurboTax, right? Do you want TurboTax to be wrong? No, I don't want TurboTax yeah. to be wrong. <laughs> because let's say that it calculates and it tells me that I owe IRS $10,000 where I should be owing less or nothing, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to create problems. So logical errors in some case, let's say that I... I would put in certain field as it asked me to fill out the form and the programmer, they might have applied an algorithm to calculate based on the input, like let's say my, my income, right? My net and gross income. And then it would take that and it would calculate it and they had programmed it inaccurately. And so it would say that I would owe tax because it puts me into a different bracket. Yeah, that would be a logical error. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Other questions? Okay. So chapter four opens up with data types, right? Last week, we experimented with print function or print method, and we use string in the parameter, right? And we would use the quotation marks around our string so a string is a type, and in the text it talks about string is text values, and it would be used for things like names, places, could be description of things too. Like I've had student turn in program for business that would sell coffee online, and in that they would have array or in 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 um, Python that would be list of different types of coffee, right? Um, imported coffee, et cetera. So we can use string for those things. And it's basically a collection of characters, okay? It could be symbols as well, okay? So now it's marked to use as a single or double quotation mark. So we saw print and inside the, the bracket or the parentheses, we would use double quotation mark or single quotation mark. So to display string, we know that we can use print. And then in later, we're gonna also look at input on how people can enter, right? Enter string. So, the example of the error here that you see is that we want to to display the whole phrase that says he states i am a student right and in this case you notice that we have the i am students in quotation marks right here so the computer it's gonna say oh wait this is a string but what about this right here, right? So idle's gonna throw an error. It's gonna say, what is this, right? Is this a string within it? It doesn't know what it is. So this statement actually generate the error because it cannot interpret I am a student as part of that string, okay? Because I am a student is inside he states, right? And the entire thing. So. What happened is that you have two set of quotation marks that are used, which cause, which cause a syntax error. So other IDE would say that, oh, this is a syntax error on this line and you need to go fix it. So the way that we can fix this is we would use an escape character and this forward slash right here tells the interpreter that we're using a character right inside that string so it treats that character as part of that string so we can say he states and then you would use the slash before that character and then a slash before the closing quotation mark so that way it's saying that that's another character and i preview some of this in lab one as an example in one of the tasks so we can simply add the escape character the forward slash. 
And then we would use that to note that the, these are the quotation marks inside that string. Okay. Now another way that we can we can switch it up is instead of using the escape character, we can use the single quotation mark as indicated, you know, by verbatim the quotes of what he states. I am a student, and then the string itself is enclosed with the double quotation mark. So that's how you can get around that. And the textbook shows some examples similar to this. Okay. So what we can do is one way is to use escape character. The other way is to use a mix of single and double quotation mark. So if you use single on the outside, you would use double on the inside, right? Vice versa. So now if we go to the next question, it's a very similar, it's the same thing, right? Just different string. Just determine why the following statement generates error in Python program. Print, she wants to be a double quote hero, right? And we, we do that all the time when we speak. We say that, oh, this person says this, right? Or we would quote and unquote. So how do you correct this statement? We can simply say that this program generates the error because additional quotation marks are used inside a string. So the interpreter doesn't know what that is. So we have to fix it, right? By simply adding the escape character or mixing up the single and double quotation marks. So I simply correct it with, she wants to be, and I add the escape character before my other quotation marks, right? And then, again after the word hero here because we want to quote the word hero so that's what we would do and then we want to finish it out saying that this is a string parameter inside the print method or what you can do is another option that you can use is we want to do print oops and we can use double on the outside. She wants to be a, instead of hero in double quotation mark, we would put hero in single quotation marks and then close it out with the double and that will take care of it. Okay. Any questions? So one way or the other will be fine. So I just wanted to show you some options there. Okay. Uh, went. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Cynthia. No problem. What's up? I have a I have a question. Um, you know how there's brackets uh between the hero? What do those brackets represent? You mean this one, the forward slash? Yeah. Oh, yes. Forward, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Forward slash <laughs> is used as an escape character. And in lab one, we touched on this. Remember, we talked about slash n for new line. Yeah. And yeah. So when you use a for slash alone like this, it just tells the interpreter that you are, are about to use a special character, which is the another quotation mark. So it treats that, that, that quotation mark as a special character inside that string. Because we go around telling people, you know, quotes all the time, right? Like yeah. I can say, oh, so-and-so said this, right? And mm -hmm. I would do that with my hands. Well, how do we really put that into like, you know, a string inside a Python program? Well, what we can do is we can say, well, we are about to use a special quote symbol by using a forward slash. Mm -hmm. And then when we're done using it, yeah, so if you simply just use that slash, right, for the, the open quote, and then you use another slash for the ending quote for the word hero. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. it's like saying, she says she wants to be a hero, right? <laughs> right. So, yeah, we would use a forward slash for that. Thank you. Yep. 
What's up? Any other question? All right. Okay. Then in the notes, it shows you a similar example. You can refer to that later on. So for a quiz and test, make sure, you know, I might give you, you know, print and then something similar to that. And I would ask you which, what's the option to fix it. Okay. Okay. For numeric data types, you would have integers or whole numbers. So earlier we saw a little bit of integers being used in shell, but you can have, you know, negative or positive whole number like 12, 400, negative 65, negative 5,000, 100, right? Then you would have floats, which are real numbers with decimal points, like 8.79, right? Or even negative, we can even have negative 96241. So you, if, as, if you see decimal points, right, and often we would use this for price or even weight, right? Like when you go to the grocery store and you would wait, right, like oranges, and it would say, you know, 2.804 pounds in digital scale, right? And if we write an application or a program, let's say to calculate the prices for all the fruits after the customer waited, so if I waited, right, and I scanned the barcode, so it would tell me the total cost of my oranges that I'm about to buy, right? So then we would use float as a data type, okay? So that way the system, the computer would know, oh, this is a decimal type of number. This number would contain decimal points. Where integers, it doesn't have decimal points. Or sometimes we would use long. Written very much like the integer, but you would use the L to indicate that it's a longer number. When do you see this bank account number, right? It has like tons of digits, ISBN for textbook, um, you know, a lot of different account numbers and things or a very large number for calculation. And you can have it negative or positive. Okay. Question? Yes. What's the, um, the threshold or the, you know, where it starts to become long? So over 32, as far as, as the bits. Okay. Yeah, so when the number cannot fit that, and you can, you know, it's optional for you though, right? Like I tell my students, I said, sometimes you wanna scale it for later use. Let's say that you have 16 digits now, but what if it's gonna be longer than that? What if you have a ton of employees for employee number, right? Let's say that you have thousands more of employees and the digits just get longer. Well, you want to expect that. So you might want to approach it with, with long, just like how you would use double in C++ versus int, you know? So in the case of Python, it has integers long and flow. So you would expect it to, to they would grow as an organization or the program would be used with a very long number Then you would use at long with the L. Then your complex, the complex would be with, you know, for calculations. So in this case, we would have square root and imaginary number. And in general, just side notes, unless you're building um, scientific calculation type of program, then you would rarely see complex number being used in Python programming. But the format is this, okay, where the J, so it says A and B are floats and J represents the square root of the imaginary number. So this, this number right here, you can say that it's the square root of an imaginary number with 3.414. Or in some cases, it would have like the exponent. So, but, you know, for our class, we just know what it is right, we would rarely use it. 
So most of your programs, you would use the other types, long integers and string and float. But the, this is for numbers only, right? We talked about string previously. So very much like other languages, you would see that sometime it would convert based on the expression or the statement when you have mixed types. So let's say that I would say H is 12, right? H equal 12. And then I would say weight equal 100.5 pounds, okay? So in this case, I would have int is an integer, which is age, and I would have weight as float. But somehow later on, I would write another statement to combine these two. Let's say I have a formula that I would say, oh, well, this is the expected calories for the intake of this age with this weight, right? So automatically, it would look at the expression and the interpreter would convert that. Okay, so if you type something like this, if you type int x, it converts it to integer, long, it's gonna convert it to long. So normally, a lot of the time, the rule for a lot of the programming languages is gonna scale out to the larger allocation. So if you have int and long mix, it's gonna try to, you know, in C++, we call it cast it, right? Or in C++, we also can tie it down to a certain type. So automatically, the interpreter is going to try to, to convert it to a larger, a larger container. Okay. So if you want to convert it to a decimal, you would say float, and then you would, you know, pass the parameter and that would allow the conversion. We'll do some of this later on after next week. So this is just to give you the overall concept. So as some of you already took some programming classes, you might see some similarity. Some of you are new to this, you can see, you can understand that yes, sometime when we have a mix of different type, it's gonna try to convert it, okay? Okay, any question? Let me get my AC adapter so I, my PC or my laptop doesn't die before we end. Okay, so let's go to the next question of our assignment. Um, so I want you to determine the data type of the following A, right? That one is easy. We can say that this is integer, right? Because it's whole number 399. This one has decimal points, so let me tap it out. Okay, this one has decimal points, so we know that it's float or floating point, sometimes they call it like that. And then this one simply is a negative whole number, so we know that this is integers. So you might see a quiz or a test question similar to this, right? I might ask you, select the integer data type from the following options, okay? And then this one is also another float. And then this one is a long. Now your book only talk about two things, I think integer and float. They kept it simple for chapter four, and then I think they might revisit it. But um, I pulled some of the additional information from the documentation, and it's always safe to go back and read Python documentation to find out more when you're working with the types, okay? And then, now earlier we did, we used the greater than and less than operator so when you do a print 99 is greater than 90 and you get a true output. So the result of this statement is actually a Boolean and which is what we're gonna get into next or a bull, okay? I should capitalize this, it's a, that's a proper way. So in Boolean or bull, 
it's really operating based on two values, true or false. And we do, we use this to check, right? Like earlier we said print, this is greater than this. And if it's true, then it's gonna output true. So in the case where the programmer wants to implement this type just to verify, to validate that, right? Then that's true, okay? Or false, so true or false. Okay, like two is less than four, that's true. So another type is list, but we're gonna get into list a little bit more as a single chapter. So think of list as like array in Java or C++, if you're familiar with that. But simply what it does is it creates a space in memory and it's gonna hold various objects and it's very much like its name. So like, for example, at home you say, oh, this is a list of chores that I have to do and it would have contain all the chores. Or, <coughs> excuse me, it, this is a list of grocery items I have to buy, right? Or this is a list of assignments that I have to do for school. So it would contain objects or values right? Or it would be a list of names of my clients that I have to go through and contact, a list of phone numbers that I have to call. So it will contain different objects and values and, and the way that we use it in Python is we would use the square bracket to store all of these objects and values. So for example, I can have a list called week and I can assign it strings to specify, which is names of each day in the week, starting from Monday and going to Sunday, right? Or I can, in the book, it uses month equal January through December. And you simply indicate the list by using the square bracket or the square brace, and it would say that, oh, that's a list. This is a container. It's going to store all of these things. So I can have a list of numbers. I can have a list of strings, right? Like if you have a music playlist, right? That could be a list and it would have all the song title and also the artist that's, that made those songs, right? So that will be two array, 2D array or 2D list. So the list can contain different objects. So now, when we would declare our list of our friends, so I can say my friends, you can name it, and we'll talk about naming convention in a little bit. You start out with the square phrase, phrase like this, and then you would put the names in string, a string in quotation marks. So. You can say, you can list their name, right? And then comma to separate from one string to another, right? And then and so forth. You can put your friend's name down. Now let's say that we're done, we close out our square brace and that will complete our list. So this one, this list, I have four names, right? And we can treat those, we call those elements. We'll get into list later, okay? And there are four strings. So the first one is Stephanie, second is Dave, and third is John, and the fourth is Christine, and you can have more, right? So we just want to create a list of our friends and we would put the strings as elements in that list. So that is also a type. It is a container that we can store values and different things there, different objects.
Okay, any question regarding list? So an example you would see is there. Next, we're gonna talk about variables. So variables are container, similar to list, but smaller, so we can only put one thing into a variable versus list, we can put many, right? So variable is gonna store one thing. And in math, you would see like X, Y, Z, right? But we want to name the variable appropriately. So variable or containers, we can put in different values and we can use it to call, modify, like update throughout our program or our script. So for example, I can have a variable called name and I can assign it a string, Marcos. And I can have another variable called age and I can have an integer 23 to represent the number for his age. I can have a variable called weight and I can assign it a float 185.25 for his weight. And I can have a variable is married and I would have a bool data type false. That means he's not married. So mm -hmm. Yes. Would you be able to put null instead? Uh, sure. But let's, you know, it depends on your objective in that. Right? Like if you have him pick, okay. But let's say that I say that, you know, this program is going to select a certain individual for, you know, that's not married for oh, tax okay. purposes. Yeah, so that will be false. Yeah, you can definitely put put the options if you allow them to, to select true or false on that. Like you would pop him a question, say, are you married? And then you would, he would say yes or no, right? If he say no, then you can put in the condition for that. So we'll get further into that in the next few weeks. So this is just an example of how, you know, variables would, would be declared and we, but in Python, right, you, when you declare a variable, you have to, to assign value to it. It creates a container, it wants to put the value in there. In other languages, you know, like C++, we can say int, right, name, and then semicolon and just make that, you know, so if you want, it to be empty and has nothing, you can put zero, right? So what it does, it creates a container and it would have nothing in there yet, but it has zero, of course, but you can, you can update it later, modify it later. So unlike the other languages, what we want is we want to make sure that we assign a value to a variable when we declare it, okay? and you don't need any kind of symbol after, you just say, and in JavaScript, it would be var and then variable name. You don't need all of that. Python, you simply name the variable and then you give it an assignment by using the equal sign and then whatever value that you wanna give it, okay? So some of the important things that you need to know is that every variable that you may create needs to hold some kind of data, okay? It says that you cannot add more than one type of data each time. So let's say that I use H23 here, right? I cannot have comma or float. No, that's wrong. So variable is gonna hold that one type of data. It's gonna cut that container just for that type in memory. It is case sensitive. So capital letter, like name like this is different than name like this. Okay, lowercase name, uppercase name, different, case sensitive. And as I mentioned this last bullet already, right? If you have nothing to put in there, you can use zero or you can use quotation mark to indicate that string, but now with nothing, empty, okay? 
All right, any question as far as variable, what it is, how to use it? Let's talk about naming convention for variable. So you should never start out your variable name with a number, never. You can use an underscore and then letters, characters after, like the example there, underscore score. Or you can use underscore following score, like score game, following a word. Okay. The remainder of your variable may be letters or numbers or underscores. So I can say username or user password one like this. Readability is important, right? And it really is for the choice of the, 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 the programmer. So we can have account underscore number like this account number like this is that easier to read than or harder and then or account i normally do like this or like like this with the uppercase so you normally capitalize the second word in that name right and if you want to separate it you can do something like this right account because you might have account different things account id account number account amount Right, so we want to make sure that you know it's as long as it's easy for you to see, okay? Because that way we can track our variable throughout. Now, a short program is very simple, but when you have like 700 lines, you know, thousands of lines, then tracking the variable can can be a little bit more challenging. But most IDE, when you click on it, it's going to highlight all of them for you, okay? Which is cool really good feature. And then we want to use descriptive name that will be useful. So think about what that program is about, what you're trying to do. If I create a program, right, to check all my network appliances, I wanted to name it accordingly, right? Or if I create a program to calculate the sales of my books online, like Amazon, right? Like I would, I would use the, and different section would have appropriate name. So some of the students that are in the beginning programming, they just use like variable name like ABC or XYZ. That's not a good practice. So we want to use descriptive name and we want to use that name effectively. That's gonna tell us what that program is about or what that section of the program is about. So like order menu, like if you're trying to create an application for something like a restaurant for to-go order, right? Total cost, <clears throat> user address, user name, right? User phone number, account number, stuff like that. Now this, the last one is just side notes. This is not really, you don't have to follow this, but this is just a suggestion. Sometimes uses I and O can be challenging because it looks like one and zero, right, in some font. So sometimes that can be hard to really differentiate between the number and the letter. But in the case where you're trying to say like, um, Retail item, you have to use the lowercase i or the uppercase i, right? But, you know, that's just a little side note. You don't have to follow that if you don't want to. Okay, all of these are just suggestions anyway. Okay, now, um, so let's do one for 10. Declare a variable for your name, age, and height in inches. Okay, so we can say my name equal, and you can name your variable anything you want. You say name, right? And I would put my name. That's the string. You can put your name, age, or my age is equal 
I'm 43 this in October, so actually I'm 42 now. And then my height. Right, so 12 inches is in a foot. I am 5'2", so that gives me 62 inches. And I just, you can use decimal if you want, as you can use float if you want. But I just want to use int, so that way I, don't, I just round off. So. Okay, so that's an example of number 10. Okay, so for 11, we ask, select the appropriate variable names from the following option, right? There could be more than one. Okay, so A, user account, is that appropriate? Sure. Yes. Yes. Chris said yes. Good. So we can highlight that. What about B? No. Yeah. So it starts with the number. So no, that's not good. We don't want that. What about C? Negative. Yeah, negative. Thank you, Sean. So that will be because it starts with the hashtag, a symbol, the only symbol that we're, we're allowed to use is the underscore in variable name to start, okay? All right, user account? Yes. Yes, very good. Oh, I'm sorry, I highlighted the wrong one. I meant to do C, so let me undo this. And I highlight, so the yellows highlight, right? Or you can type out the answer A and D. Um, are the appropriate variables. Very easy. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so we want to create of uh, for a 12, we want to open up IDLE, we want to create a new program that uses the variable that we declared in 12. Now be careful with copy and pasting. So if you copy from Microsoft Word over to, to Idle, it's not gonna interpret the symbol very well. So I just wanna let you know that. And you know, so you know, if you wanna retype it, you, can, you should retype it, right? Programming class, we gotta type to program. So, so I'm gonna go ahead and close this. I don't want to update the save. So I'm going to go ahead and make a new file. And then, so I can say that this is a Python program about me. <laughs> no. uh, that display my information or my description. Okay, so first we need to declare our variable. So name is equal to, and you can put your name, right? And we can simply print it. Oops, sorry, I had a typo there, print name. And then I can have another one called age or my age, which I previously did. So let me fix this. Actually, it's okay like that. Age. And I will put my the number for my age and I can just do print. I wanna do better. My, so we wanna print a, a, a string first. My name is So what we're passing is in this parameter, we're passing a string that says my name is 
What about if I use something like this? Right? Can I do that? Let's see. I am What about this? Okay, with the comma. And then earlier it's height, right? So height 62 inches for me. We're going to go ahead and print my height is height in inches. I'm going to double check and make sure I don't have anything mistyped. And then I'm going to go ahead and save this. Uh, I'll put it in CIS 30 folder. So you can save it on your desktop or whatever you like there. So that was, um, what question was that? Number 12, right? So, <clears throat> So I can just say me.py, whatever you like to name there. So now let's run it and see if we're getting an error or not. Nope, it was successful. So in shell, it shows that here's, I print it, right? I print the string, it says my name is, so there's the string and then I brought down the variable which contains the, another string called KC. Okay. And then H is 42. And then I have a string. I print out I am. And then it's going to bring down that 42 and plug it into that H right there. And then my height is 62 in inches. So I declare that height is 62. And then I print my height is, and I pass three, right? I pass one string that says my height is, and then the variable, which contains 62, and then in inches is another string. So it gives me this. My name is Casey, I am 42, and my height is 62 in inches. Okay, so any question? So if it's throwing an error, likely that you might have something wrong with your parameter or symbol. Did I hear someone have a question? Yeah, I, I have a, it's not a syntax error, but there's a, let's see. It says um, trace back most recent call. It, was it on the age? No, on my height. Oh. I get I get the first two. Okay. Did then, you pass it like this? Yep. Did you have and you oh, make well, sure I that, found it. I found that I spelled height wrong. Young, yes. So make sure that you have it matching. So whatever variable name that you declare, make sure it matches when you bring it into the parameter. Okay, so when we finish that, go ahead and take a screen capture of both. You can use Windows Snippet or however you want, you can do that. And paste it onto your answer document so that way you don't have to upload separate files. One file contain image and answer, that's good. Okay. Okay, any question? And of course, we can add more to this. And then as you add more to the program, you can, you can, uh, you know, resave it and then rerun it. Okay.
So we took care of 12. Okay, so before we touch on 13, I want to swap back to notes real quick. And notes give you an example on page four. It says to display content of multiple variables in print use comma, separator, and parameter. Another way is to use concatenation, which is the, the, operate, the plus sign operator. So the example is that we have first name and it's assigned Carla. So we declared first name variable here and it's assigned Carla as a string. And then last name, we declared as Dominguez. So we can do print first name comma last name, it would say Carla Dominguez, right? And then we can have another option where we use the plus sign, it would print Carla Dominguez, but stuck together, no space. So when you use the concatenation, you notice that the second choice, it gives you no space there. Okay, so when you use a plus sign operator, there's no spaces included. So if you want it a little cleaner as the print method, using the print method, we want to use the comma as a separator in the parameter. So, right, um, we are to create a program. So we need to use my first name, my last name, and we want to need to print it super easy. So I'm going to go ahead and make a new file. And I'm going to close this. So first, uh, I'm going to go ahead and comment this so that way you know this is a program. Python program to print full name. Okay. So we will start with declaring our variable my first name. You can use underscore if you like, right? Which is Casey. My last name. Put in your last name. And then what we can do is we can do a print method here. And then we simply do my first name, exactly like how it's typed, comma, my last name. Make sure that it's typed the same way. And then we're gonna go ahead and click File, Save As. And then I'm just going to call this full name dot py. Then press F5 and it shows my full name. So as you can see here, let me shrink this down to or minimize it here. As you can see here, right, I declare my variable, my first name. I gave it a string assignment. I assigned the string Casey. My last name is another variable, and I assign it the string win, which is my last name. And then I simply use print my first name, comma, my last name as it is declared. Otherwise, you're going to get an error, right? And so put that inside the parameter there. And then I click save, give it a file name, and I click run. Now, if I add the other option, if I do print my first name and my last name like this, let's save it and then let's run it, right? See how it's stuck together now. So concatenation just combine those strings and together there's no space or white space that's added where when you're using a comma in the parameter like this, the first option, it gives me that space between my first and my last name, like what is explained in the notes, okay? So if you want it a little cleaner, use the comma, the separator in the parameter.
Any question? Oh, Dr. Wen? Yes. I had a question. Um, I was trying to do that with the uh, list, um, and, but you can't, uh, you can't, con what is it called? Concatenate the list, right? It won't let no, you. No, yeah. We'll talk about how to handle the elements later on how you can combine them. But okay. yeah, so um, yeah, don't try to use list for this one because you're going to run into complication. Just use a variable. Okay. Two variables. Uh -huh. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so once you have this, take a screen capture for me of your script and your output. Okay, you don't have to do both of them. You can just do one option, right? Like the first one is fine. It shows your first and last name cleanly with the white space and we're good. Okay, so now, so take a screen capture for 13, right? And that's what we wrote. And also output, I wanna see if you run it correctly. Okay, so for the next part, oh, do you have any questions for me so far? I'm gonna pause and ask that. No? Or yes? Okay, let's move forward. We got about, about 30 minutes. Okay, so we should be able to address some of this. It's super short, we're almost done, okay? Um, so we saw how Carla Dominguez is printed out using the separator or the concatenation then for the value to be converted, it shows an example in the text and I took this from the textbook. So you have text one variable that holds the string zero is equal to, and then text two uses uh, an integer zero. So when we concatenate the string with the zero, right, it's still gonna output it. So it converts it to the string. So what you have is you can convert it to the string by typing the type, by adding the type in front of that variable. So here what you're doing is you're printing out the string and another string by converting that zero into a string within that parameter. Okay, so what you do is you can convert the type by specifying the type here, right, and then bring in the variable within another parentheses or another bracket. So you would have zero is equal to zero. So this zero at this point now becomes a string. It's no longer an integer, okay? And that's another way that you can do this where we would change one type to another now it says to print out both string variable and numeric variables all at the same time without the need of the concatenation or conversion, you could use the F in front of that string and then simply bring in the variable inside the curly brace, right? What that F does is it's used to tell the interpreter that it's using the original format so it's using the formatted, it's just formatted as a string. And so it's still converting in the back, but just saying that, oh, I'm just gonna format this into string now, okay? So to look at the next question, right? You're given the following statements. Name is Jennifer, right? Name is Jennifer. We declare the variable and we assign it Jennifer string. Age is declared as a variable, and this is an integer, 21. Print, here's the format. My name is name, and my age is age like this. What's the output? It's still gonna say, my name is Jennifer, and my age is 21, right? So if you don't believe me, we can make 
the file and then we can run it. Okay. So, oops, sorry. So we can say name is Jennifer and age is, oops, sorry. What type out is uh, 21, right? And then what we have here is we're going to try to, let me move this over. We try to have the format for string with the print method. So we would do a print and F in front of the quotation mark, right? My name is in curly brace name. Oops. Curly brace, curly brace name. And my age is, again, curly brace age. And then we can close that and we can close this. So it would look like this, right? So with that, what that does is we're gonna go ahead and click save as. And then we can call this uh, format.py. If we run this, we would see that it's still going to show my name is Jennifer and my age is 21 based on the given statement, right? So I simply, you can take a screen capture for output or you can type out the answer. That's up to you. Professor, I had a question. Yes. Uh, when do you use the, the F for formatting? When you want the output to be string specifically. So for example, like, let's say I'm making a game and I have all of these scores, right? And the, the, the winner score, <coughs> is, oh. bless you. Oh, sorry. So the winner score is, let's say a thousand, right? I can print out your score is a thousand and you won the game, right? So I wanted to convert that 1000 into string. I can use the F or I can do the other way. It's, it's really, you know, this, this is just like a one line shot. It's cleaner. It's, it's, it's efficient. I would do it, you know, using the variable within the actual string itself like this, but you can format it the other way too. So, yeah, so if you add any time that you want to convert it into text format or string format, this is what you would do. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi. Is Hi. This, is this a um, way of uh, doing with a format? Is that unique to Python? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, that's so. mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of like really cool, you know, shortcut ways to do stuff in Python compared to other languages. Like in, in C++, we got to cast it, you know, and then, you know, or sometime it, it automatically casts it, but you can convert, of course. So without the conversion, this is like, it's still converted in the back. The interpreter still does it in the back. It's just a way that we can command it to do it in our program. Mm -hmm. Okay, any question? All right, so the last part, this is my favorite, is input. We're not gonna get into raw input and different types of input yet. This is kind of like what we did last week. We preview print and we work with print. So I wanna preview this now. So when we do the lab this week, you would you know, be able to do more. So the computer is all about recording what can be entered by the user and then it would be outputting something, whether it's printing out or it's displaying something. So in our program, you want the user to interact, right? We just don't want to show a bunch of things. We want to also allow the user to enter whether numbers or text or something, right? Um, so input is a function that would accept different type of input like numbers or string. So for example, I, but first in order to recording the kind of input, you have to give them some kind of details about that input, like 
enter your age, enter your name, right? So that way people would know what to do, right? You can't just, just have input. You have to tell them what they need to enter. So in order to use it, we need to provide some kind of reference to that input. What are they entering? Okay. And you don't, in, in Python, something in like in C++ and Java, we might need like three lines to do this, right? Or Java, you can do it, you know, in maybe one or two lines. But for Python, we can achieve it all in one. Right, we can declare the variable and tell, say that it's an input at the same time, which is great, okay? So the example for this is, let's say that we want the user to enter, type in their name. We can say username equal input and then the instruction, right, with the string, enter your name. So we can achieve all of this in one line. Then next is use user age, input, enter your age. So you just have to pass in the instruction because in C++, you have to say C out, enter your age, username, and then you know you can do get line or you know various things. So it's multi lines in that, but we can get it all in one shot in one line for Python, okay? Is it better coding style to declare it and then ask for the input or is it better just do it all in one line? I think it's efficient to get it all in one line and use the built-in functionality of Python because you want to maximize the capability of the library that's given to you in Python. Programmer before you, they, they made all of this ready for you to go, right? So why do we go back to square one? Now, if, if, if it's your preference to really break it down individual line, it's really for you to understand your program. But as far as efficiency, we want more efficiency in, in, in how your system is gonna perform, right? So that's, that's my perspective on that. So I would suggest like, you know, use the library and built-in functionality better. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can create your own function and do or method and do different things. But yeah, I say why not, right? If if they already give us the motor to build the car, put it in and you know build the other parts and then drive your car away, versus um, you know having to you know cut out metal and be able to build your motor. Okay, so. <clears throat> For 15, last one, right, before we end, it's short and sweet. Create a program that prompt the user to input their address and their phone number, right? The program must contain appropriate variables and input method. Provide the screen capture of your script and your output, okay? <clears throat> so I will do part of it with you. but you will have to do most of it on your own. It's just very short anyway. So I'm gonna close this so we don't get confused. So I open a new file and I can comment this. This Python program accepts user. Where was that? Uh, address and phone number, right? And you can add name to it if you want, but I want you to practice. So we want address and phone number. And now the phone number, think about how many digits that you're using, if you're using country code or not with the area code, et cetera, right? Like the one before the area code. So if you want to use long, you can use long. If you wanna use int, it's still gonna be able to cut it up to a certain amount, but if we want to be safe, we can use long. So that's up to you. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and look at, and you can refer to, you can refer to the notes example if you're not sure on how to create your input, your variable with input. Okay. So let's say that first, like, 
I wanted to ask for their name and I can ask for their um, address and phone number. So you can say user name is input and open bracket there. Enter your name just like what is stated there. And then close that. And then we can say user address. Now, address, what type do we want? Should you be using? Should the address be string? Sure. Right? String can handle numbers with the number, it would display number and street because with the address, Right, this is why sometimes it's better to break it up into field, right? Like address number would be the number to your address and then street name would be the string. And then we would have city would be another string. And then the zip code could be characters, right? Could be another string. And then the actual zip code number would be, you know, could be integer or longer, right, if you included all the extensions to that zip code. So what we can do is the Python in the back, a lot of the times it's going to try to automatically detect based on that, right? We're going to be able to cut that space and be able to fill it. But now if you need to format it, then you can format it into a string when you output it. Like you say that your address is this. Right, so input, enter your address. Oop, I'm missing a quotation in the front there. And user input. Enter your phone number. I don't use input in, in my string because that can be confusing to students or other people. So I just said enter and most people would know that that would mean that I would, they would type in. You can go more, right? You can go like enter your age, enter your height, et cetera, et cetera. And then test it and see if it works. So you have to test it with the value, right? And in testing, if you find that if you type out the whole address and if it doesn't fit, then think about how you would be able to utilize data type for that, right? How you should, should you convert it? Should you format it into a certain format? Right, or maybe break it up into different variables to store different things. Like, like I said, address number, street address, right, street name, city, right, state, and then zip code. So I'm gonna go ahead and go save as. And then we can just put add phone. Name it whatever you like there. And let's click run. So we can say, and we can test it. Right, one, two, three, four, main street. Nine, 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 nine. Now, if you want to be more thorough, we can print all of whatever they enter, right? Because it updates it. So how can we do that? We can say print user name. Actually, we can say name you entered and then comma user name like this. So that way they know that that's what they entered as name. Print. Address you entered. 
user address. Make sure that the variable is exactly the same, right? And then we print again, phone number you entered, user phone. So as we update this, because, you know, I might not know if, that, if, you know, so, but it shows right here when you test it, but we can validate with the user. So my students in C++, they like to do the, the validation. You can do control too, like on what, what you want them to enter, how many digits, and we'll do that with conditions down the line. So I put in Casey and it shows here, right? One, two, three, four, main street, nine, 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 right? And then it gives me the summary again. Name you entered, Casey. Address you entered, this. Phone number you entered, this. And we can clean it up and make it look better, of course, but. So here's my script. We can say is to make it nicer. And then we run it. So here it is. Even though it shows that we give them the summary on what they enter, right? So if it's wrong, then they can go back. We can have it loop back and have them fix it. We enter and update that variable again. Okay, any question? I had a question. Sure. Um, so in C++, you know how you have to declare the type of variable it is, whether it's an integer or a flow or a string. Yeah. How does uh, Python, or how, like how does the computer know what type of variable it is? So it usually refers to what is being input as far as a lot of time they just use a static space, meaning that it's just going to be like this much right and so most of the time python is detecting it based on what you had added here so as but you know that whenever you enter from a keyboard it's always going to come in as ascii value and all of that gets converted back to zero and ones anyway so it's in c plus plus what we do is we pre-cut the space based on specifying the data type, right, like int, and that will be a, a specific size or double a specific size. So Python in general, it just cuts a space. And then based on that, right, like we can adjust that to really fit, but mo all the input from the user, it comes in as ASCII characters, which is ultimately treated as collection of text string. Okay, and then yeah. one more thing. Um, what type of variable would the address be considered since it has both numbers and... So the way that I use this here, like I would treat it as a string because it would still display my number with the street name, right? Okay. And in string, mm -hmm. but if you want to make it specific type, then you have to separate them, right? Or you have to convert it. So mm -hmm. we can say that, you know, you have to, and this is why when you fill out online forms or different application form, you would see that they are have very specific because they have that going into the database in specific field, right? Like the number mm -hmm. goes into column and then the street name goes into one column because they're a different type. Mm -hmm. You see? So, yeah. yeah, it's really your approach. I mean, on a complex level, if you handle thousands and millions of users, I would separate it 
So that way you can quickly search and sort. It's much better than for the algorithm compared to like going through each of the character in the string and then write the algorithm for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Okay, we're coming close to the end now. Um, I will pull the attendance list for the Zoom today. Um, so make sure that we get this completed. I opened this assignment until the second, so if you don't have it done today, that's fine. You can turn it in by the second, then it won't be late. And then I will open lab two for uh, our Wednesday session. Don't forget that next Monday is a holiday. We won't have class. So if you have both of my classes, the Python and the computer forensic, we will not meet next Monday, the 7th, because we have Labor Day. And so, um, but we will meet on Wednesday. So I will do a mix of lecture and lab for both classes. I'll ask what we do today. We have a little hands on and I like to do that with my students so you can see a little bit more on how you would write a program in Python or for forensic we'll do it. We use some tools and such. Uh, okay, any other question before I sign off? And then those of you, I might see you at five. I will see you at five for computer forensic and I will activate my module soon, so. Okay. I have a we, question kind of unrelated. Yes, so. sure, no um, problem. The, certifi the certification vouchers for CompTIA so, um, um, yes, I got, I got a discount on the one for being a student, like you told me, mm -hmm. um, for the security plus, if I were to take the Linux plus, um, if I wanted to get the Linux plus exam too, would, uh, would they give me another discount yes. on it? Okay. Yes. They're separate ones and see, well, we have partnership, which is about equivalent or a little bit lower, but Moreno Valley college won't, we can't accept money coming in like that it has to go through the foundation so let's say that if you want to buy a voucher from us because we're a partner because technically partnership that's what we could do is to sell voucher to student but we can't do it that way and then we can't go through the bookstore because it's owned by a corporate so long story short it's better to use your student membership but i will try to see if there's any other discount through our partnership that i could get for you yeah, because um, that was expensive. It was a big discount. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. a big discount, though, for sure, being a student. Yes, yes. But it was still pretty expensive. Right. Um, be, and I try to get the funding to put money into that, but now all the grants, they have, like, fine print saying that we cannot use it for voucher. Before we did, like, before, like, two, like, like two years ago or last year, that's why we were able to buy NCL uh, vouchers. But since a lot of institutions start using all the money went to that and they started like, no, no, you know, or people abusing it then. Uh, so I couldn't do anything about that. So what I could do is I did reach out to CompTIA about buying institutional license. The only one that they sell for that is Cloud Plus. And um, I did start writing the course for Cloud Plus. Like I have like maybe three pages into it. And I couldn't finish it during the summer because there's so many things going on for me for mm -hmm. this, this summer. But um, yeah, but I, yeah, I would, you can get another discount with Linux class. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. That's a good one to take. Definitely. If you want to make good money, Linux administrator. Ooh, yeah, that or Red Hat or, you know. Well, I figured it would just make me more employable getting oh. into cybersecurity if I have Security Plus and Linux Plus. Yes. Uh, especially cybersecurity and even in development, I tell my student to learn Linux. It's important that you do because a lot of companies use Linux. So, yeah. okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. So um, if you want, you can type in your name in chat before we go, just to get, you know, make sure that you remind me I was here, but I normally pull the participation from Zoom in case Zoom has air, but type in your name. And I wish you have a wonderful at late afternoon evening. I'll see you here on Wednesday for lab two, which is going to be pretty fun, like what we do today. And um, have a good one. All right, you too. Bye. Thank you. Bye.
Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Don't forget to enter your name. Aiko, are you okay? Do you have any questions for me? Okay, so I'm gonna sign off real quick. And so I go, if you don't have any questions for me, I'm gonna end the session. Okay, take care, have a good one. Hopefully you can add the class soon. I saw your email.